picture of the epithelium in the larynx. So what kind of epithelium do we have in the larynx? Pseudostratified, or were those cells pseudostratified, they're columnar, what do they have on them? Cilia. Cilia, right? They are ciliated. I remember I always try and tell you guys that from the surface it looks like shag carpet. Like there are so many cilia sticking up that it really looks like shag carpet, and it does, right? Like there are tons and tons of these little hair-like extensions that stick up off of the surface of the cell. And again, they all move in kind of a rhythmic fashion so that they can move and push the mucus across their surface. Um, here we see the whole respiratory tract. Again, up here, we're gonna have this pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Then right back here, we switch to um, stratified squamous because food and water also go back there. But then here at the larynx, we go back to our ciliated epithelium again. So we've got cilia and mucus cells present throughout all of these tubes that you're seeing right here. It's only the itty bitty little tubes at the end where we don't have cilia and mucus cells anymore. Again, the whole point there, the mucus cells are gonna coat these tubes with a layer of nice sticky mucus. And the idea is that anything bad that you should not be inhaling and getting down into your lungs gets trapped in the mucus. Okay, so dirt, dust, pollen, pathogens, any like bacteria, viruses, whatever, it all gets trapped in that sticky mucus. And then the cilia, remember, move, they, boot, they, they, um, they beat rhythmically together to push that mucus up and towards your throat, right? And then you, <coughs> and you can choose to either spit it out or swallow it and it goes down to the acid of your stomach. But either way, all that nasty stuff that you have in the mucus is not making its way down into your alveoli, which again, we said are very, very sensitive. So we don't want bad stuff making it down there to them. Again, the cilia, or, or sorry, the cilia, the alveoli, are very <coughs> delicate. Why are the alveoli so delicate? How, what are they made of? Simple squamous cells, right? Again, I think of it like tissue paper, right? Like the little tissue paper you put in gift bags. That stuff is super delicate, right? Like you put water on it and it crumbles, it tears super easy. It doesn't hold up to anything. Your alveoli are super delicate. So we really try and protect them. Um, we call all of these kind of different mechanisms that we utilize to protect the lungs uh, the respiratory defense system. So we have this whole series of mechanisms that we use to try and filter out the air and then to try and trap any particles and to warm the air and humidify the air and make sure that it's nice and perfect and clean by the time it gets down to the alveoli. So when we look at this respiratory defense system, um, the first kind of component or first thing that we do is again, we try and filter the air with the hair in our nasal cavity and in our nose. Right? So we have this hair that literally like comes and crisscrosses like this in our nose. And that's very protective. Um, if you've ever like, I, I always use the example of cutting the grass, but like cut the grass or doing dog work, something where there's tons of dirt and debris flying everywhere. Afterwards, you blow your nose and you'll see that like there's a lot of junk caught in your nose. Um, that's good. You don't want that junk to make it down to your lungs. And your hair does really good at catching the big stuff. So the big dirt, the big you know pieces of grass, any of the large things get caught in the hair before they make it down your respiratory tract. Then we have our mucus cells, our goblet cells, um, that make mucus. Okay, we all know that we've got a lot of mucus coating our respiratory tract. From the nasal cavity, again, all the way down through the bronchi, we have mucus. And mucus is really sticky, right? It's supposed to be sticky so that dust and dirt and bacteria that get thrown against it or somehow come in contact with that mucus get stuck to it. So instead of going in the air and making it all the way down to the lungs, they get stuck and trapped in that mucus before they make it down to the alveoli. Um, remember that the, the only way that this mucus works or is beneficial is in conjunction with the cilia. Okay, we don't wanna trap a bunch of bad stuff in the mucus and then let it drip down into the lungs because then it's just carrying the bad stuff down to the lungs and it's clogging things up. So we need the cilia in order to move that mucus up towards the throat so that we can then spit it out or swallow it or whatever and keep the pathogens away from our lungs. We call the combination of the mucus and the cilia the mucociliary escalator. Right, mucociliary, so mucus and cilia 
and an escalator, right? You just hop on and it just all the way up. And that's kind of the goal here to take the mucus and just all the way up through all of the respiratory, um, the respiratory tree. So we filter out the <coughs> stuff, then we use mucus to trap stuff. The cilia pushes that mucus away from the lungs. And then finally, deep down the lungs, we have alveolar macrophages present. Okay, remember a macrophage is a big eater, right? That's the Pac-Man. So we've got these Pac-Man immune system cells that roam around the alveoli and just look for any type of pathogen or debris or anything that made it past all the other defenses and got deep down within the lungs. So that's kind of the last line of defense there um, to try and, try and get you pathogens that make it all the way down. or CF is a condition that affects that mucociliary um, escalator. Okay, so it, it directly impacts the mucus that's made in the respiratory tract and our ability to kind of move that mucus out and away from the lungs. So cystic fibrosis is an inherited disease. Um, it's autosomal recessive. Um, what that means is that you need two copies of the defective gene to be symptomatic. Right, so you get, you know, DNA from your mom and you get DNA from your dad. This is recessive, it's not dominant. So it recedes into the background. So if I get um, on this, specific protein that we're going to talk about. If I get the CF gene here, but over here it's fine, this is recessive. So this good one covers that up and it's fine. You don't have any symptoms. Um, however, you are a carrier, so you could possibly pass it on to your child. Um, the only way that you actually show symptoms is if you've got your DNA from your mom and from your dad and you have that CF uh, mutation on both genes then there's nothing to dominate, right? They're, they're, yeah, it's recessive, but look, when you go to, to try and get the good gene over here, it's not here either. You've got the CF in both places. Um, so then you would be symptomatic. So when we look at CF, what it is, is it's a problem with, to kind of simplify it, chloride transporters. A problem with chloride transporters on cells. Um, it mainly affects the respiratory system. Um, we see symptoms in the digestive system as well. Really places where we've got glands making secretions. So the digestive system, we've got a lot of glands making secretions. The respiratory system, we have glands. What are the kind of secretions that we're making in the respiratory system? <coughs> what kind of mm. mucus, right? We're making these mucus secretions align the respiratory tract. Um, it also, we can tell in sweat glands Right? Sweat glands are making sweat. This is another kind of secretion that we're releasing. Um, so we'll see, we actually do a sweat test to test for this. We test the sweat to see if it's very, if the sweat is very, very salty. If it has excess salt in it, that tells us that we have a problem with these chloride transporters. But the main problem as far as we're concerned with the respiratory system is that the mucus that's produced is extremely dense and viscous. Okay, so the mucus should be sticky Right? We should trap pathogens, but it needs to be able to be moved by the cilia. With CF, there's not enough actual fluid that gets into the mucus, so the mucus is very, very heavy and dense, and it overwhelms the cilia. The cilia are unable to actually move the mucus. So what you're left with is this mucus that catches all the bad stuff and then just drips down. And it goes down and down and down into the little tiny bronchioles, and it just ends up clogging up um, the actual passage, the air passageways in the lungs. That, and then it also takes the pathogens and brings them deep down into the lungs instead of away from the lungs. So you don't have that, um, that protective benefit of the cilia and the mucus. So we have frequent infections occur as well. Um, there's no cure for CF. Um, it does typically end up being lethal. The predicted age, I don't know, survival right now, this is an old number, so it's, it's likely changed in the last like five years um, since I looked it up last. So what do we do? Um, we get antibiotics because of, to prevent infections and to treat infections. Sometimes people are on antibiotics all the time. We use azithromycin a lot, um, but lots of antibiotics. 
You can do postural draining. So like, just like it's gravity that's bringing the mucus down to the, the lungs, you can posturally drain the mucus out of the lungs. Um, <clears throat> but it's really, we replace sodium. Hyponatremia is common, so we'll give um, sodium to replace the, the sodium that's lost. Um, but it's, it's really difficult to treat. And again, there's, there's no cure. Um, all right, so when we look at the respiratory system, we said that one of the functions of the respiratory system um, is speech, right? And we produce speech in our larynx. So going through the respiratory tract, remember we have the, uh, the nasal cavity, and then the pharynx or throat, and then from the pharynx, the air goes down into the larynx or voice box. And from the larynx, it's gonna go down into the trachea or windpipe. So as that air is passing down through the larynx and into the trachea, it goes through that slit-like opening, right? There's like a little protected kind of guarded opening that carries the air through the larynx and down to the trachea. And we call that the glottis, right? That opening that the air goes through is called the glottis. When we look at the larynx or voice box, we see that the larynx is a cartilaginous structure, right? So it's made up of multiple different pieces of cartilage that just surround that glottis. They're created to kind of encircle and go around the glottis and they protect the glottis. And then again, we also utilize them when we talk about producing sound. So we have some big main cartilages present. The main cartilages of the larynx include the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, and the epiglottis. The thyroid, cricoid, and epiglottis, again, surround and protect the glottis, right, or that entry down to the trachea, and they surround and protect the vocal cords. When we talk about this, this kind of passageway, the larynx going down to the trachea, Remember that right above that in the pharynx, we have air coming down, right, that should go into the larynx and trachea, but we also have food and water coming down. That food and water that we swallowed uh, from the oral cavity down to the, into the pharynx or throat. So we need to make sure that the food and water go down the digestive tract and the air goes down the respiratory tract. We talk about this a bit in lab, but remember the way that we do that is by utilizing this epiglottis. So when you swallow, and you can see this and feel this, right? When you swallow your larynx, your whole voice box, this whole cartilage box is brought up in your throat, right? So swallow and feel it, <coughs> right? You can feel that occurring, just like you can watch when, especially on guys, you can see the Adam's apple bobbing up and down as you swallow. That's your larynx moving up. Remember that the reason the larynx is pushed up is because then the epiglottis folds down over this glottis. It folds down, so the cartilage piece folds down over the top of the larynx or over the top of that opening down into the trachea and it forms a lid so that now the respiratory tract is closed and the food and water that you're swallowing have to go back into the digestive tract instead. Okay, so that's a major function of the larynx to close off the glottis or close off the respiratory tract when you swallow food and water so that they do not go down into your um, air passageways. So here we see the larynx. So just this is the larynx and that's connecting to the trachea down here. Okay, and above it is the pharynx or throat. Again, the main cartilages are the thyroid cartilage the cricoid cartilage, which connects to the trachea. And then here you can just see part of the epiglottis. The epiglottis, again, is like kind of like an upside down spoon and it sits like this, right? And it goes up and down over the top to form a lid um, on top of that glottis to close it off. We also have a couple pairs of smaller cartilages that are part of the larynx. So we have two auriculate cartilages and we have two corniculate cartilages. Remember these um, two pairs of cartilages sit in the back of the larynx and they're involved in a couple different functions. The corniculate cartilages are involved in opening and closing the glottis and also protecting the vocal cords. 
Um, the corniculate cartilages, remember, attach to the vestibular folds, which we'll see in a second inside the larynx. The two arytenoid cartilages are involved in the actual production of sound. Remember, the arytenoid cartilages are attached to the vocal folds, which again is vocal, right, where our speech or where sound is produced. Okay, so the arytenoid cartilages are involved in producing sound. The corniculate cartilages are involved in kind of opening and closing and protecting that clause. So the larynx is a big cartilage box that we call the voice box. The larynx is made up mostly of cartilages. We've got some big cartilages that surround and support the entrance into the trachea and surround and support the vocal cords. And then we have a couple pairs of smaller cartilages that open and close the glottis and control the vocal cords so that we can produce sound. We also have a couple pairs of ligaments present inside the larynx. So we have two vestibular ligaments and two vocal ligaments that stretch across the larynx from the front to the back. Okay, so literally a ligament that connects the front to the thyroid cartilage, and then it goes to the back and connects either to the arytenoids um, or the corniculates. Okay, so they stretch across um, the center of the larynx. When we look at these ligaments, we see that they're covered by folds of epithelium. So this is where the term fold comes in, like vestibular fold and vocal fold because you'll literally have, I cannot draw this, but you have like the thyroid cartilage in the front, and then you'll have like your arytenoid and corniculate cartilages in the back, right? That's your larynx. The ligaments stretch like this, right? Like one, like a cord, a, a straight cord. It doesn't cover everything, it's just a string. Like picture if a rubber band was stretched all the way across there. So what we do is we have the epithelium, so the lining of the larynx over here, the actual like, like skin tissue comes in and folds over this and then comes back out again. So it like hooks over the ligament and then folds back out. So this ends up all being completely covered with epithelial tissue. So you don't see the actual like cord or ligament. What you see is this, this fold of epithelial tissue coming out and over it. So you've got these two folds coming in on either side. So we end up with a ligament that's covered with epithelial tissue. And we say that we have vestibular folds and we have vocal folds. Again, looking deep down inside the larynx. The vestibular folds are on top of the vocal folds. So we have two vestibular folds and then just underneath that we have two vocal folds. The vestibular folds are um, a bit stronger and tougher. And again, they lie on the top. So they help to protect the vocal cords and again, they help to kind of prevent stuff from going into the respiratory tract that shouldn't be there. So we talked about this in lab, but that's that kind of like when something goes down the wrong pipe, right? You don't mean to swallow, but something sneaks down and then you catch it <coughs> and you cough it up. That's your vestibular folds that you have to thank. Those are the ones that are catching that before it goes down into your respiratory tract. Here we see a sagittal section or kind of like a side view of the larynx. Again, the larynx is really just like, we have this opening, this slit-like opening that goes down into the trachea and we have our vocal cords and we surround and protect it with all of these cartilage pieces. So you can see like this big thyroid cartilage. You can see the cricoid cartilage. Okay, so this is like the front, this is the back. And here in the back, you've got this arytenoid cartilage and then on top of it, the little corniculate cartilage. We said the arytenoid cartilage, this big one, connects to the vocal ligament. So there's that vocal ligament that stretches across. And then on top, we have the vestibular ligament. And this is just showing you like half of it, but we would have these skin folds or epithelial folds that come up and fold over that and then go back. And then fold over that and then go back. Sound production occurs in the larynx because of the vocal cord, the vocal cords or vocal folds. Okay, so it's that bottom delicate fold that's actually producing the sound in our larynx. Um, now, air gets passed through the blood.
glottis right through the opening and out every time we exhale. So air is getting pushed through my glottis. <coughs> air is getting pushed through my glottis. I don't necessarily produce sound when air gets pushed through the glottis. See, the reason for that is that the vocal folds are not always tense. When the vocal folds are relaxed, no sound is produced. And again, the easiest way to picture this is just to think of a guitar string. Right? If you have a guitar string, if it were completely lax and not attached to anything whatsoever, you could pluck it and you would not make any sound. Right? It's not going to make sound if it's just the string sitting here like this. You have to tense it. It's got to be attached on both sides and have some tension so that it vibrates. And it's the vibration that produces sound waves that you can hear. So we can push air through the glottis and not make sound. But if the arytenoid cartilages tense those vocal cords and put some tension on them, then as the air rushes past them, it causes them to, to start vibrating. And that's when we produce this sound, right, that we utilize in speech. Now, we also utilize the arytenoid cartilages to vary the sound that we're producing, right? We can produce really low sounds, or we can produce higher pitch sounds. And the way that we alter that, again, is by repositioning those arytenoid cartilages and adjusting how much tension we have on those vocal folds. Again, just like a guitar. How do you tune your guitar? Right, by putting more tension or less tension on the guitar strings. Um, when, we when we reposition the arytenoid cartilages to increase the distance between the, um, the front and the back of the larynx, so we pull back and we tighten those vocal cords, we increase the pitch, right, through the higher pitch. If we reposition the arytenoid cartilages to decrease the distance, so we kind of loosen those cords a little bit, then we can go ahead and um, decrease the pitch through the pitch falls. Now, when we talk about the actual sound that we produce or this actual speech that we produce, it's not just what's occurring in the larynx. Okay, so intelligible, understandable speech is actually a combination of two different processes, phonation, and then we also have articulation, or sometimes articulation is called enunciation. Phonation is what occurs at the larynx. It's just a raw production of sound. But we have to utilize our teeth and our cheeks and our tongue and our lips to actually articulate or enunciate that sound to produce speech that's intelligible. Okay, so the larynx itself is not producing speech. The larynx is just producing sound or phonation. We have to alter that sound to make it understandable. So here we see, this is the front and the back. This is looking down through the larynx and through the glottis and into the trachea. So this is like the larynx itself, right? We've got these cartilages, the epiglottis. Um, you've got the thyroid cartilage would be like in front of this, like down below. And then in the back, you've got your corniculates and your root noise would be underneath that. Um, but you've got these cartilage pieces, right? That's the larynx itself. When you look down, this opening, this slit-like opening that goes down into the trachea is the glottis. Okay, in this case, it's open. Here you see that the glottis is closed, right? There is no opening here. There's no, you can't see down into the trachea. You're looking at a closed glottis. Um, so that's down to the trachea, and then you can see the folds. The vestibular folds are the folds that are on the top. Again, these are kind of stronger and thicker and protective. The vocal folds uh, lie right underneath that. Again, the vocal folds are where we're going to be producing our sound. Okay, so ultimately with the respiratory tract, we're bringing air deep down into the lungs, right? We're skipping um, a lot of the actual respiratory tree, like the bronchi and the bronchioles. Uh, we covered them in lab, and really they're just tubes that carry air for the most part. We talked about the bronchi being bigger and having cartilage. We talked about the bronchioles being smaller and having muscle. Um, so we're just kind of making our way down to the lungs and realize that we've, we've skipped those, right? We had the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, then the bronchioles. And ultimately, we're going to bring air deep down into the lungs, into the pulmonary lobules. Um, when we looked at the lungs in general, remember they had these deep fissures that divided them into lobes. Right? How many lobes does the right lung have? Three. Three. How many lobes does the left lung have? Two. Two. Right? So you've got this big mass of lung tissue with these deep fissures that break it up into different lobes. 
Those lobes are further divided into tiny, tiny little compartments that we call lobules. So the lobes get divided up into lobules. What we see is that we have these little connective tissue partitions, these little like fibrous connective tissue sticks that will go into the lung tissue and divide it up. And we call them trabeculae. So the trabeculae will go into each of the lobes and break the lobe up into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller little sections. Eventually we get to the little lobules. So these smallest little trabeculae we call interlobular septa, the septa like your septum, right? Like a separator, interlobular because it's between the lobules. So the smallest little fiber sticks will go in and we'll find these little interlobular septa that divide the lobes up finally into the itty bitty little lobules. Okay, and we'll see that um, the airways, like the bronchioles, the blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, nerves, all of this stuff kind of follows these um, trabeculae as it makes its way deep into the lung tissue. It's kind of like a roadway for that stuff to get deep into the lungs. So let's look at this. That's kind of what makes sense of what we're looking at. This is outside of the lung tissue. Okay, you see the pleura, which we'll talk about um, next lecture, but the parietal pleura, the pleural cavity, the visceral pleura that lines the surface of the lungs. Okay, so this is outside of the lungs, this is the cavity, this is the actual lung tissue. Um, this is showing you the interlobular septa. Okay, so this is the actual like lung tissue. This is the connective tissue, this fibrous little kind of stick that comes in and breaks this up into one lobule. So this is a lobule. There'll be another lobule over here. There'll be another lobule over here. Gets divided up into these small little sections. What we see when we look at the respiratory tree, so if we look at all the tubes that are leading down, right? We had the trachea, we had the bronchi, primary, secondary, and tertiary bronchi. And then we go into little bronchioles, and eventually we get to this terminal bronchial. A terminal bronchial is the bronchial that's leading down into one lobule. So like this is a terminal bronchial right here. This would be leading down into one lobule. So there'd be a cluster like this right over here with these little steps in between. Same thing over here. So this could be classified as a terminal bronchial. So we would have another lobule over here with lung tissue. So then here, this would be a terminal bronchial carrying air down into this lobule. The terminal bronchioles will end up branching into a few respiratory bronchioles. Okay, so you'll have like a little tiny, so terminal bronchioles, then little tiny respiratory bronchioles, and those little tiny respiratory bronchioles will bring air down into the alveolar duct, which remember opens up into the center of this alveolar sac. Okay, so just so you kind of can see the way that the air flows through these. Again, each terminal bronchial is going to deliver air to one lobule, and that terminal bronchial is going to branch into multiple respiratory bronchioles. So, bronchi, two bronchioles. from like just normal, whatever the first bronchioles we have, we go to the terminal bronchioles. Terminal bronchioles go to respiratory bronchioles. Okay, and then that goes to our alveolar duct, okay, which is bringing the air into the alveoli. So that's like the flow of air as we're going down the respiratory tree. So the terminal bronchial brings air into that one lobule, right? That one little like section of lung. And then the terminal bronchial branches into respiratory bronchioles. We said that respiratory bronchioles, bronchioles are the thinnest, tiniest little bronchioles that we have. And that their walls are so incredibly thin that we can actually have some gas exchange occur in them. Okay, remember they were included in the respiratory portion of the respiratory system. They don't just conduct, they do allow some gas exchange to occur in them. And then they deliver air to the alveoli. 
they were most of our gas exchanges going to occur. Um, we said that the respiratory bronchiole is connected to the alveoli along that alveolar duct. And again, the way that we described it in lab is that like, if you think of a hotel room, at a hotel, you have like the long hallway and you just file off the hallway into all the different rooms. Um, when you look at the respiratory tract, the alveolar duct is like the hallway and you just go off of the duct into each of the alveoli. Okay, so the air comes down the hallway and then just flows into each of the rooms. Comes down the duct and flows into each of the alveoli. show you the one little alveolar sac. Okay, so like this is a lobule, right? A terminal bronchial is coming into the lobule. That terminal bronchial branches into respiratory bronchioles. This is showing you one respiratory bronchial coming into this alveolar, this little like cluster of alveoli or alveolar sac. So this comes down like this. Right, the respiratory bronchial carries air down into the alveolar duct. The alveolar duct opens up into all of these individual alveoli. Um, also notice guys that we have a ton of elastic fibers covering the lungs. That's really important for exhalation. Um, we bring air in and then in order to push the air out, we just let those elastic fibers snap back to their original position. So there's tons of elastic fibers surrounding the alveoli. Um, also, again, notice there's tons of capillaries everywhere. So covering the surface of each of these alveoli, we have a bunch of capillaries, and that's for the gas exchange to occur. The capillaries have to be right there next to the air in order for the oxygen to cross into the blood and the CO2 to cross from the blood back into the air efficiently. bronchial flowing into the alveolar duct which flows into like the alveolar sac. There's another um, alveolar duct coming into this alveolar sac. And then you can see tons and tons of alveoli everywhere. So this just kind of shows you the surface area. Okay, right? these are all, this is the lining of the alveoli. So there's tons and tons of surface area everywhere because of all of those alveoli. All right, so the last thing that we'll do today real quick is just talk about the alveolar epithelium. Um, what's an epithelium in general? What am I talking about when I say epithelium? Lining. lining, perfect, it's a lining. So the alveolar epithelium is just the lining of the alveoli. When we look at the alveoli, we said it's mainly made up of, or they're mainly made up of what kind of cells? Simple squamous cells. So we call those pneumocytes type one. So these simple squamous cells, they're just structural, right? They just, that's all they do is really make up the lining of the alveoli, these pneumocytes type one. Okay, simple squamous cells, they're really thin. They allow a really short distance for gas exchange to occur. We also see um, alveolar macrophages. Remember we said those were part of the respiratory defense system. They roam around the alveoli looking for any type of pathogen that actually made its way down to the lungs. And then they just engulf and destroy anything that shouldn't be there. Yes, they're part of the immune system. Finally, we also have cult cells called septal cells or pneumocytes type two. And these are really important because they produce this kind of oily secretion called surfactant. Okay, so most of the cells are pneumocytes type one. They're just structural. However, scattered throughout the alveoli or the alveolar epithelium, we do have septal cells that produce an oily secretion called surfactant. On the next slide, we'll talk about why surfactant is so important. So surfactant is an oily secretion um, and it contains phospholipids and proteins. Okay, phospholipids, remember, are important because they've got that phosphate part that likes water and then the lipid part that hates water. Right, so they're amphipathic and that allows them to interact um, in kind of a different way than most molecules. When we look at surfactant, what it does is it forms a thin layer on top of the water that covers the alveoli. So when we look at this alveolus, it's this really thin, really delicate layer of simple squamous cells. And it's surrounded by water, right? Our whole body is, every cell in our body is surrounded by water. 
so there's water everywhere. When we look at a bunch of water molecules, what do those water molecules want to form with each other? Hydrogen bonds. hydrogen bonds, right? These molecules are all super attracted to each other. They want to form hydrogen bonds with each other. And that, that, that bond is strong enough to collapse air bubbles, right? Like if you think about like when you pour a liquid, there's air that gets trapped in there, right? And the air is less dense. It floats up and the, the water um, bonds with the other water molecules are all attracted to each other. They collapse those air bubbles. Um, so these, these water molecules are actually strong enough to collapse the alveoli. Again, it's like tissue paper. It's super thin, it's really, really weak. So these can try and like interact with each other and can form bonds and have these attractions that will then go ahead and collapse that whole alveolus. So we don't want that to happen, right? We need the water for lubrication, but we don't want to collapse the alveoli. So what the surfactant does is it comes and it interacts with these water molecules so that they don't interact with each other. So it prevents the hydrogen bonding between water molecules so that the water does not collapse the alveoli. Um, so in, I would say it reduces the surface tension of water because remember it's surface tension that, um, that those hydrogen bonds create. So again, this is super important in keeping the alveoli open. Um, and if we don't have enough surfactant, we can see something called a respiratory distress syndrome occur. And what that means is that every time you exhale, the alveoli collapse. When you inhale, there's pressure holding them open. But when you exhale, they'll collapse because of the water. Um, you, need, you need surfactant to prevent that from happening. So without the surfactant, every single time you exhale, your alveoli collapse. And then you have to inhale strong enough to burst them open again. So it's a very forceful inhalation every time and it's exhausting. So you go into respiratory distress syndrome. Um, we see this, again, when the septal cells don't make enough surfactant. And what type of patient do you think this would be most common in? Which kind of patients? And what age group? Um, what? Um, that's different. That's bronchioles. But you do see really difficult breathing. In there. What patients do you see? Um, what age group do you see with lungs that are, I don't know how to explain this. Babies, premature infants is what I'm trying to say. I don't know how to phrase this question. Um, but we see the premature infants when their lungs aren't developed fully, what we mean is their septal cells don't work yet. So that's the problem. They have lungs, but the septal cells don't make surfactant. So their lungs collapse every time they exhale and they've got to inhale so forcefully. So you see their little chest and their little bellies working so hard to try and get air in. Um, we can get, if we know that the mom is gonna deliver prematurely, we can get her a steroid. Um, we typically give beta methazone to the mom and that will help the baby's lungs develop more. Um, if the baby's already born though, we can give cow or pig surfactant via a breathing tube. So we actually put that surfactant directly into their lungs um, and that, that can help with the respiratory distress. Okay, that's it. I promise the next lecture guys is much more interesting. This lecture is like talking at you.